Fun has been our theme for this series. We've been in a series called Things Yet to Come, and it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is the book of Revelation is, and to show, uh, this is the thing that God gave to him, to show his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. That is the theme of what I'm talking about in this teaching. Um, verse 2, who bear record of the word of God, of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and all things that he saw. I want to reiterate one point that I made early on, and that is the reality is that a lot of people think the book of Revelation is a book of prophecy. Now, not really. It's a book that is an unveiling or a revelation of Jesus Christ. When you get a revelation of Jesus Christ, you have to then get a revelation of all the things that are going to unfold as a, because they are connected with him. Now, next week, I think I'm going to talk, I think that I'm going to talk to us about um, God's purpose in Israel and God's purpose in the church that leads us up to the, basically to the tribulation. We're going to talk about that. But tonight, I want to continue what we talked about last week. Uh, tonight is part four, putting on immortality, and, and it, this is continued. Uh, for tonight, we're going to go into this. Let's pray and ask God to help. In Jesus' name, Father, we love you. Thank you for your presence tonight. Thank you for the people of God that have gathered into your house tonight. We give you praise and glory and ask you to bless this teaching. And everybody said amen. Could you greet four or five folks, whoever you can reach near you there? Greet them. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Good good crew tonight. Good to have you here. And everybody said amen. Now, I, I bear with me just a super quick little recap. Uh, John saw a revelation of Jesus Christ, and God showed him the picture, the big picture, of things that are coming. Now, the Bible, as we've been discussing, is 30% of it is predictive prophecy that but works down to roughly about 2500 promises predictive promises that are in the word of god from genesis to revelation and at this point in our history roughly 30 percent uh i'm sorry 30 percent is is how much predictive prophecy there is but as of this point roughly 80 percent of that or about 2,000 of the 2,500 predictive prophecies has been fulfilled. So when somebody says that that Bible is just a book of myths and just all the, they're, they're either, either they are incredibly uninformed or they're incredibly lying, one or the other. Because the truth of the matter is the Bible defends itself. And as each passing year goes by, and more predictive prophecy becomes fulfilled, the Scripture is, is confirming its own reality over and over again. Can you say amen? Now, it's been determined that there's roughly about 500 things left yet to come. So what's the odds of the 80% already happening? And the overall odds are, when they calculated this by math, is 10 to the 2,000th power. So the question is, if the odds of, of, of what's happened already, are, you know, is that high and yet it happened so i'm telling you that means in my mind the last 20 percent the odds aren't as high <laughs> because the odds are getting more and more predictive along the path so bring up first corinthians 15 this is where we were talking about last week we were talking about what happens when you die and what 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 it means to put on immortality paul is writing and he said behold i show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. Everybody say changed. It's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to happen at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. And the reason that we're going to be changed or the explanation of the change is verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So we were discussing last week, and we're going to talk a little more about it, I think, in the next session. But this stage of history, I think the next, 
the next prophetic things that are on the the marker uh, is is we're waiting for two things. We're waiting we're waiting for the trumpet, uh, the 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 rapture of the church, and we're waiting for the tribulation. I believe those are the next things up. Now, and when Paul was talking about us being changed, he was referring, he was teaching him that chapter about the rapture of the church. Bring up slide two, if you would. I saw a funny cartoon that I loved. A couple of nails are talking there, and they said, when I heard a loud bang and I turned, he was gone. That's the moment in the twinkling of an eye. <laughs> and that's how it's going to be. <laughs> that's how fast the Lord is, the, the catching away of the church is going to be. However, I do want to point out, it is impossible that millions of people can disappear at one time and it not have any effect. And, and, and by the way, I don't think it's a secret thing the 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 Lord uh, you know is going to meet the church in the air. I think a lot of people is going to see it. Uh, we'll get into all of that yet to come. But what I what I want to talk about is, or we were talking about in the last session, is if we don't go to meet the Lord in the air, then we are going to die. Okay, all of us are are appointed on it's appointed unto men once to die, and if we die before the rapture takes place, then we become part of that great cloud of witnesses, what the Bible calls the dead in Christ. And as we discussed last week, there's a huge difference between people who die in faith and those that die as unbelievers. And God, when God created Adam, he breathed a portion of his spirit into him. And the spirit of God that breathed in, God, everything that is life on this earth comes from God who is life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. So when God breathed into Adam, his spirit animated Adam's flesh. And God, and Bible says, Adam was made a soul, a living soul. I think when the breath of God, the best way I know how to describe it is when God breathed into Adam, he not only had, he not only kept the spirit of God in him that, that gave him life, but it also cr created a brand new soul. Now that soul was created in the image of the spirit world. And it has, our soul has many of the same attributes, if not the same attributes as the angelic world. Except the fact that we're made just a little lower than the angel. In that we are housed for a season in this old house. <laughs> and when we die, the body, the Bible is clear, goes back to the earth. From dust you came, dust you shall return. Our flesh goes back to the earth to decay. Uh, the spirit that God gave us that animated the flesh goes back to God who gave it, the Bible says. The, but the question is, what happens to the soul? That soul is a brand new individual and that soul, when it separates from the body, is going to go to one of two locations. It's going to transition from flesh, and it's going to go to one of two trans, uh, uh, locations, and they are totally opposite. Now, one of the things we left off last week talking about when we ran out of time was we were talking about how busy the earth is with, with, with you know, life on this planet. And, and we talked briefly by the way about Lazarus I just remembered that when uh, and and the, the question is is Lazarus the story of Lazarus a a parable I don't think that it is because in all the parables that Jesus ever taught he never gave an individual name to a story and remember that a parable is a earthly story that tells a spiritual truth that's unfolding remember what Jesus was revealing in the story of Lazarus was not something that was uh, happening here on earth, this is something that happens in the afterlife. I don't think Jesus was trying to hide this. I think the Lord wants us to have a glimpse of what's going to come after we leave this earth. So consider the fact that there is so much spiritual life as well as physical life. Right now, in this history of the earth, there are more human beings alive on this earth than there's ever been in history. 
So the earth is, is, is very, very busy with human life, but there is even more angelic life, which also means demonic life, going on in this world than there is even humans. According to Scripture, there's 10,000 times 10,000s of thousands of angels that were created. They're spirit beings, and, and so they're, they're on the earth. All the animals on the earth, the, the, the insects on the earth, the plant life, this planet is booming with life. But most of us live our lives, and we're only familiar with what's going on right around us. And even then, we're not really aware of the spirit world because we're not tuned in enough. So the truth is we encounter demons and angels probably on a fairly regular basis, but oftentimes we don't recognize it. Uh, angels operate in almost every church service that we gather, particularly on Sundays when we're having altar services. Uh, angels are at work in this house uh, um, uh, there have been even demon possessed people that come walking in to the services among us, and now not everybody is a, is attuned to what's happening. So you can go, and and not just here, you're in counter room every day, at work, and 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 Walmart, and like I was joking, I, especially after midnight at Walmart, you are running into some demonic activity, <laughs> got some crazy situations going on. Um, what I'm simply trying to say is we're mostly oblivious. But God offered to the New Testament church, in when he gave us the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he also gave us the ability to seek him for the spirit of discernment or the discerning of spirit. So we have a spiritual gift that allows us to have our spiritual sentences, senses heightened, that we can become more sensitive. We can hear things occasionally in the spirit. We can sometimes even see things in the spirit. It's usually not ongoing. It's brief glimpses, but most of the time it's a perception or a, a feel that we sense uh, because angels respond to assignments that are assigned to them by God, and most of the time they have to do with interacting with this church. Let me show you an example. Bring up Hebrews 1 and 14. Uh, the writer says, are they not all ministering spirits? This is small s. It's not talking about the Spirit of God. It's talking about the spirit world that are sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. There's not a one of you that are baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, that if you've been walking with God for any length of time at all, there's not a one of you that has not been ministered to and helped by the angelic world you just may have never even realized it. Which, by the way, when you turn the page a few times to the 13th chapter of the Hebrews, it says, Let brotherly love continue, and be not forgetful to entertain strangers, uh, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. In other words, you need to treat people right. And, and you need to just, you know, and, and don't assume that every, every person you meet is just a just a typical human situation. There are there are times I'm not telling you to look for this left and right. I'm just saying I would guarantee you any child of God that's been walking with God for any length of time, you have been ministered to, whether you ever understood it or not. Matthew twenty six, if you bring it up on screen, verse forty, and he cometh to his disciples and findeth them asleep. This is Jesus coming out of Gethsemane. He says unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Here's what's interesting. Here's where I want to go. The spirit indeed is willing, small s. It's talking about our spirit, our soul. It's willing. But the flesh is weak. Now, what that means is, is our human spirit, that our soul that God created in us, it is willing to obey God. It is willing to 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 seek God and to follow after the spirit of God. The problem is is that this this spiritual man that we have is also housed in a carnal house. And that carnal flesh that 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 flesh within it, it's 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 weak. Now, you know, it's it's an all in how you want to describe that word. You know, 
some ways you could say it is weak, other ways you recognize it's very strong, you know. But the, what makes it strong or weak, however you want to look at it, is that it is, it fights against the spiritual man in us. So the human spirit's willing, and Jesus was telling him, said, you, you know, the flesh is weak, you know, wake up, pray with me. Watch and pray is what he was said. You, you, you don't want to be caught unawares of what's going on. They had Bible prophecy that was unfolding all around them while they were snoozing. And I'm telling you the same thing happens with us. While we're just going about our day-to-day routine, God is, is fulfilling things. Even sometimes when we're walking around thinking, man, what's God doing? God's doing all kinds of stuff. The question is, are we sensitive to recognize what God's doing? Now, consider people who are unredeemed, people who don't know God, don't want God. Well, they're, they're, they're almost always just totally insensitive to the Spirit unless they, they start getting curious and start tapping into demonic-type spirits through occultism and different things like that. Uh, you certainly can. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says the carnal mind is at enmity with God. In other words, it's in a state of war. There is a declared war between the flesh and the spirit. My flesh and your flesh wars against and is combative with our, our soul that is within us. But at the time of death, the spiritual man can become more alerted. Most of us walk through our day-to-day life, there's a veil that, that covers between the spirit world and the natural world. But many times... I would say very, very often, as we near the moment of death, there is a time when, and it's brief, but there's a time when that veil is beginning to lift and the transition is beginning, and sometimes if people are still alert and still have their mental capacities, and I realize not, you know, many times we're in a coma or so forth or unresponsive by the time that happens, so I'm not saying we always do it, but I'm telling you it is not uncommon that people can become animated at the time of death or near death. And, they, and sometimes they're animated different ways. All of us can tell stories. There's testimonies left and right of people who died lost and people who died in more of a saved condition. Some people died very peaceably. Had it, it, in, in some, some have, have had loved ones, you know, and they've asked, Who's that stand next to you in the room? Some have even recognized angels that have come. Uh, but there's on the flip side, there's people that have had a, a, a horrendous time as, as death is approaching, and, and they're, 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 they're animated. They, they're, they're pushing away back from it. And I'm just saying that it doesn't happen every time. I'm just saying that there's times that it does happen, and Adam... In the garden, he had a communion with God that was very clear. It appears that when Adam was first created and Eve, that they interacted with the spirit world. And in other words, there wasn't the same veil between the spirit world and the physical world as there is right now. It appeared to me, I mean, remember Adam, according to the book of Genesis, if you're going to take it in the little sense, which I do, he literally had a conversation with the serpent. And he said, well, I was a metaphor. Well, it doesn't matter if it was metaphor or actual. It's the same point. Mm-hmm. He was interacting with, with the spirit world, with an angelic being. But when sin entered the equation, it required God to adjust the veil settings between the kingdom. And it forever changed the interaction between the spirit realm and the fleshly realm. Genesis chapter 3 and 7 on screen, the eyes of both of them, Adam and Eve, were opened. Everybody say open. Mm. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, the devil had lied to them and said, if you'll eat of the fruit, you'll become like gods. Well, as he always does, he lies. He tells a partial truth, but then lies. The only thing that happened that caused them to become more like God was that they... they they became immediately aware of, of, of evil. It's like little children. You know, little kids can run around in a diaper or whatever. You know, they, no shame. <laughs> it's, it's ironic to watch them. They'll come to a certain place and stage, and all of a sudden they start getting conscious. 
and embarrassed, you know, about things that they they didn't think much about before. That's kind of what happened in the garden. All of a sudden, Adam and Eve became embarrassed about a condition that they'd been in. Verse 8 goes on to say, They heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. The reaction of carnal flesh is to avoid God. Adam lost his spiritual interaction with God, the smoothness of it, every day. And interestingly, by the way, Jesus came and restored much of what was lost by Adam. We now, as the New Testament church, have a much greater interaction with the spirit world than than they had in the Old Testament because of the work of Jesus Christ. Adam's eyes were opened to their new spiritual state, uh, but then his natural eyes became limited more to the natural world. And they had chased Lucifer's lie, and it came with a heavy cost. Bring up Genesis 3.23. Therefore the Lord God sent them, sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. And verse 24 shows the cost. So he drove out the man and, and, it, and, it, and placed him at the east of the Garden of Eden placed at the east garden of Eden, the cherubs, with a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now here's why. Adam would not be able to eat of the tree of life. As long as he could partake of the tree of life, he would continue in a state of immortality. Because when we were originally created, we were not created to be mortal beings. We were created to be eternal. Sin is what change that and so in in this concept Adam could not he could not become immortal while being in a sinful condition God's not going to allow it and so it put Adam in and by Adam I mean uh, eventually obviously all of us into a condition where now death entered in to the equation and we we're going to, as Adam, are going to require redemption. We have to be redeemed. So the serpent lied, and the things that Adam gained were far less than what he lost. And whenever you tangle with the devil, it's always that way. The spirit world became closed off. The automatic entranceway that he had became changed. And now death would become manifest in humanity. When God told Adam that in the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die, I'm not sure that Adam even fully understood what that meant because he'd never seen death. And when he explained to Eve what it was, what's death? Well, I don't know exactly. I mean, I think I know. and and It means, but it's, it's like Noah when he was trying to explain why he's building the ark in the middle of a field when it had never rained. It's it's just you know so yeah we kind of have a theory but but we don't know you know and the spirit world and and here's here's what I'm want to say from that point on it became appointed unto men once to die no do over you and I are going to die we have to because this mortal must put on immortality. Because Adam and Eve had immortality, and they took it off. So the point of the church is restoring what Adam had lost. The spirit world, even though Adam had lost this, the spirit world kept spinning all around him. All the people that were born that were kept coming. History just kept unfolding. But their eyes, if I could use the biblical word, had scales that seemed to come on them. Bring up 2 Kings 6. Remember when Elisha, uh, you know, his servant came out and he was concerned because they were getting ready to be pounced on and arrested or maybe even killed. And, and he said in verse 16 on screen, he said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they which be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw 
And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. He had come in because he was concerned because what he saw in the flesh and the natural world was dangerous. And, it, and it's opposing. It's, it's, it's ready to do battle. It's ready. And, and, hey, we're in trouble. We don't have enough. And, and Elisha come out and look around and say, we got plenty. <laughs> because there's a lot more going on on this planet than you realize. And he had to literally, God had to lift the veil. You, you follow what I'm saying? That veil between the kingdom. So the Apostle Paul experienced this. Bring up Acts 9 uh, in the New Testament. He experienced this not only physically but spiritually. Uh, verse 17, remember when Paul was on his way and the and the Jesus encountered him and the light shone on him, knocked him off of his horse, blinded him? He, God allowed him to, to experience physically the condition he was in spiritually. It was a metaphor, all right? Now, watch verse 17. Ananias went his way and entered into his house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul... The Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell off his eyes as it had been scales. That word scales in the Greek was lepus or lepus. Lepus, I think it's pronounced. It literally meant to peel. Something was peeled off of his eyes and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. I would present to you this, the blindness that came on Saul, who would become Paul, was a spiritual blindness that had been placed on him, that had a physical reality to it. And, and when the scales were lifted off or peeled back, lepus, then all of a sudden God allows his spiritual eyes to become open at the same time, he allowed his physical eyes to be healed. Now, it's a mystery, but somehow our natural eyes, we, we understand how our natural eyes sees the world around us, but we don't always see, we, we only see glimpses of the spirit world around us. And it's a mystery. I, I'm, not, I'm not telling you I can explain exactly how it happens. What peels back? How's the scales? I, I'm not sure. All I know is, in general, what the book says about it. Our physical eyes see the natural realm, but our soul perceives the spiritual realm that is around us. And it's not uncommon, as death approaches, that the veil is pulled back, and sometimes even people who had not been very discerning of the spirit world in their lifetime, may at times become very aware of it at the end. Or it can also be the opposite. People who are very aware of things in the spirit throughout their life all of a sudden can become very aware in those last few moments. Let me give you the story of, a, of an actual example that I believe is a phenomenal story. Most of you, particularly younger, would not know who this is, but bring up slide three. I want to tell you briefly the story of Sam Kennison. Sam Kennison, at one time, was a Pentecostal preacher. And basically, Sam became a backslidden Pentecostal preacher. And he went, now, at a time, there was a time in his life, first of all, he came from a family of preachers. He was, a, uh, he was from a multi-generational family of Pentecostal holiness-style preachers. I don't think it was apostolic, but it was, you know, it was similar. He had his father, I think, was, his uncles. There was a, it was a multi-generational family. And he had become very young, started out as an evangelist, he had had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He had been sensitive to the Spirit. He'd been used of God. He had a, a generational calling that was on his life. But something got terribly turned around and sideways in him. He got married at age 21. His wife was 19. And I don't remember the details of the story or how it unfolded, but he had a very, very disillusioned issue that arose up when his marriage fell apart. In just two years, he ended up getting a divorce, which in turn 
in his mind was, you know, torpedoing any things of ministry. He got bitter in, in all of this. It was a bitter situation. He became angry, not only toward his wife, but toward women in general, actually. And, and what's a really amazing story is that he went from being a Pentecostal preacher, he ended up becoming a stand-up comedian, but not a clean one. Crude, loud, raunchy, foul language. It, 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 it's, uh, I mean, it was just like you almost couldn't believe the, the one extreme to, to the other. He became known, and this happened within a few years, some way or another, Satan, I believe, when, when he was able to snare Sam, I believe Satan opened up the pathway for a life on the fast lane. And within a period of a few years, he was doing clubs and this and that. He ended up on Johnny Carson's show and on Dave Letterman's show, and he was getting, you know, he was becoming famous and other big comedians were. This is going back in the 1980s. But he was raunchy. He was, he was known for not only his, his onstage persona, but he was known for his wild parties, his drug use, alcohol issues. Uh, uh, he, even in his shows, he would rail against women, rail against marriage. He, he was just screaming and, and just, I mean, it, 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 was, it was, it's just the exact opposite. Now, you ask yourself, how in the world does a guy go from Pentecostal holiness preacher to, to this? Here's how. You need to understand this. Because it's not just true with Sam. It's true for all of us. In general, our capacity for spirituality is equal to our capacity for carnality. Or reverse. Our capacity to be carnal, you can say, is equal to our capacity to be spiritual. So in other words, when you come across somebody who you see is in drugs and a drunk and this and that and the other and vile, and, and you think to yourself, oh, man, they could never walk with God. They can, oh, yeah, they could. <laughs> you show me on a scale of 1 to 10, you show me somebody that's dove down into 6 and 7 in all kinds of vile sin and stuff because they have the capacity for this. They have a capacity to go further into sin than even others did. And you think, wow, you know, and, and people really, But let me tell you, if you have a capacity to go to seven in carnality, that means you also have a capacity to go all the way to seven in spiritual things as well on the other side. It, it, it's, it's an amazing, it's just an observation I have <laughs> that I've made through watching a lot of life through this time. Rolling Stone magazine did a profile on him in 1989, and they summed up his act this way. Now think of this. This is what Rolling Stone magazine said about Sam Kennison. It said, I quote, It's hard to tell if Kennison's audience is being entertained or simply getting led down his highway to hell. The world was even saying, whoa, this guy has gone from extreme church on one side to, to the other. And life was, was, was good. And despite his railing against women and this and that and the other, uh, in the first week of April in 1992, he got married again. They just flew back. They'd only been married for six days. They just flew back from Hawaii. He was, he was in a car with his wife on their way to Nevada to play a sold-out casino. Money was flowing in like crazy. His fame was gaining ground. And, and, and I mean, it just, I mean, he was having a, a heyday. And, and the whole time, he would at times mock church. He would mock ministry. People would ask him, well, you know, because they were curious. Well, well, you know, what was it like to be a preacher? And so well, he'd jump up and start animating and act like he did in the pulpit. And, and, and it, it's as if God tolerated it for a season. And then all of a sudden, on April 10th, 1992, on their way to this sold-out show, a 17-year-old boy in a pickup truck, I think it was, somehow veered into his lane in the middle of a highway. Terrible crash took place. His wife, I believe, survived, but Sam got out of the car, and witnesses said 
witnesses because there were traffics right there. People got out of the car. That car banked off on the side of the highway. Sam made his way out of the car bleeding. And he stumbled and fell onto the side of the highway behind his car. And a witness that was there told the story of what happened because they, they didn't know what was going on. For They said, Sam is there. He's obviously hurt. He's bleeding. But he's looking, he's looking up to someone. It's, it's like somebody must have been. It's as if he was talking to somebody standing behind the car. And he's yelling back and he said, no, not, not. Why now? Why now? Why now? And he said, he was talking to nobody, but yet he was talking to somebody. He said, all of a sudden, it's as if he was listening. And the, and the witness that was there said, all of a sudden, he became compliant. And he just bowed his head. He said, oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. And died. I believe at that moment that death was coming upon Sam. That gifts that were given that were without repentance were continuing to operate. I believe the spirit world was unveiled to him. It wasn't the first time that it was happened. I believe it had happened many times in his life. I believe he knew what was happening. I believe he was talking to the angel that had come to separate his spirit. And I don't know what was said in the exchange, but I think, and, and, and I'm not really trying to give Sam a hard time on this. I'm just saying I, I'm using his story because I think it's, so, it's such an amazing example of what I'm trying to teach. But I, I personally believe God had said enough of the mocking. And he was only 38 years old, died in his prime, on the side of the road. Bring up slide four. This is a picture of his tombstone. And I want you to notice on the top of it a stain that they had engraved on his, on his tombstone. It said, in another time and place, he would have been called prophet. And notice on the right side, there's, a, there's an inscription of a holy Bible. And on the other side, there's the two-faced mask of drama. And then the weirdest thing to me is the little ghost sign in the middle. I'm not real sure what that was to symbolize. But when I looked, when I, when I looked at this, I recognized that, that describes the battle in Sam's life. The carnal side versus the spiritual side. The, 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 the warring against knowledge. Now here's what's amazing. He had performed some things live that had been recorded before he died. That had not been, because he had put out, uh, you know, albums, comedy albums. And again, they had mature eyes. There was vile language and stuff. And so his estate put out one last recording of him the following year after his death. And I want you to bring up slide five. This is a picture of the cover of it. And they call it Sam Kennison Live from Hell. And the sad reality is... That's probably exactly what was happening. The spirit world can, on occasion, reveal itself to the natural world. The Bible even said that times we entertain angels unawares, but sometimes we are aware. We know angels can appear to people like Abraham outside of his tent. We have a thing in theology called a theophany. A theophany is whenever God himself takes on a human a uh, visage, a temporary form, and, and there's a big theological debate as to whether Melchizedek in the Old Testament, was, was he more than just a, a normal man? Was he perhaps a theophany in the time of Abraham because Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, and Melchizedek was something that was different than all the others. He was both high priest and king of Salem at the same time, and no one else had ever been in that level. So there's a, there's a debate. Was, it the, was he a theophany or not? One of the craziest stories in the Bible is, is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah after, after you know, or, or just before the destruction of the cities when God sends two angels that evidently 
formed themselves into the form of man. They made themselves visible to the physical world. And they show up to knock on Lot's door and, and to get Lot and his family to be delivered because God's getting ready to destroy the city. And that city had become so vile and so much homosexuality and stuff. And by the way, homosexuality was not the predominant sin of, of, uh, of Sodom. The, the predominant sin of Sodom was pride and ego. Sexual sin is usually a byproduct of a greater sin or a more original sin. But it's all sin. These guys were so that the homosexuals showed up in their, on their city and they, they're pounding on the door of Lot saying, send them out. They literally wanted to, to, to have sexual relationship, homosexual relations with these men. Now these men, again, assumed they were, they didn't know. You talk about entertaining angels unaware. They didn't know what was going on and the angels had to inter, inter, you know, interrupt and, and they, were, they were literally forcing the door in when finally an angel opens the door and, and sweeps his hand or whatever and, and smotes them with blindness. And turns the lot and says, are you done fooling around here? Let's go. I mean, it's one of the craziest stories of the Bible. <clears throat> and you may experience a painful death from disease or an accident or whatever. You, I, I understand in the process of dying on the fleshly side, we can experience pain. But what I want you to know is, the moment we actually do die, though, when our spirit is separated and goes back to God where it came from, that is not painful. That portion is painful. And bring up 1 Corinthians 15 again. Again, I want to remind you, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and the mortal shall have put on immortality, then, everybody say then, mm -hmm. shall be brought to pass the saying that's written. Now watch. He said when, when death comes to the flesh and the spirit, your, our soul, is taking off the physical house that's mortal and, and taking on just the spiritual part of us that's eternal, he said it's at that moment that moment that we that the saying was written for, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Everybody said amen. The sting of death... The sting of death is not the dying experience. The sting of death is what happens at the moment that we transition. If we die in sin, in a sinful condition, unredeemed condition, this transition to the spiritual world has a terrible sting to it. What brings the sting of death is sin. It's not anything that happens on the physical side. It's describing what happens on the other side. Uh, and, and, and those who die lost is totally different from those who die saved. For the saints of God, the transition is, for us, it's the ultimate healing. Sometimes great saints of God were battling diseases and sickness and pain and hurt and and. and, and you know, they say, well, we pray for them to be healed. And, you know, if we have to be honest, sometimes God chooses to heal by way of death. <laughs> because everything that's causing the pain and the, the hurt and the trauma is on the physical house. So God releases us from the house. Revelation 21. Know this, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is talking about the people of God. And there shall be no more death. Why? Because that which is mortal has now put on immortality. And neither shall there be any sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain 
for the former things are passed away. Everybody say passed away. Mm-hmm. I, I cannot underscore enough to you the totality and the permanence of that transition. Once we pass through the death process and the flesh is laid down, our spirit is heading on in a direction that it will never come back to what it was. After we put on immortality, the age-old question that people ask is, okay, now I'm not going to get in tonight where, where we're going. We'll get into that later. When, when we die, the spirit of those that are lost goes into a holding place. The Bible talks about Hades, Shoal, there's different, you know, Tartaros, there's different Hebrew words that were used that the Jews taught. But we know that, that our spirit, it, it's going to come into the presence of God. But here's what we know. The question is, will we recognize each other in heaven? Well, that's an interesting point. Let's bring up 1 Corinthians 13. The Apostle Paul is writing on this topic, and he says in verse 9, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Everybody say in part. Now he said we know and minister in part. Everything we do, we're doing it with a limited vision and knowledge. But, but when that which is perfect is come, that word perfect means complete or mature. Whenever, whatever he's describing here, that it, when maturity comes, then, everybody say then, mm-hmm. that which is in part, and that word part means in, in the Greek, an, an allotment. In other words, that, 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 has been, that small allotment that we have shall be done away. So our limitations that we live with now shall be done away with. Now, as a continued metaphor, he explains it a different way in verse 11. When I was a child... I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but, everybody say but, Mm -hmm. when I became a man, I put away childish things. In other words, the limitation is gone. The limitation of what? The limitation to understand, the limitation to see. When I was a child, there was all kinds of things I was looking at that I didn't understand, but as I became a man, I get it now. I, I understand now. So what I the world I live in now, I embrace much more than I ever did as a child, but I'm still living in an allotted parted time. I see through a glass darkly, he says in verse 12. Or now, everybody say now. We see through a glass darkly. But, but, then, everybody say then. Now it's through a glass darkly, but then we're going to see it face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, and that word know in the, in, the, in the Greek literally means to become aware of. The Greek word is epignosko. It means to recognize. But then when, when that which is perfect has come, which, which I believe is, is talking about, of course, Jesus, but it's also talking about the maturity of our time. When our time in this flesh is done, then the limitations of of us living in part and only seeing in part and being able to function in part is going to lift. And now all of a sudden, as I look through a glass darkly, but then I'm going to see it face to face, and, and I shall know or I shall recognize things even as also I am known or as I am recognized. So, while we're wearing mortality... Things are fuzzy at best. But when we put on immortality, we are going to see with crystal clear vision. And we will understand and recognize things the same way as others will be able to see and and recognize and understand us. Now, again, I I cannot overstress the finality of flesh. It is done away with. And I think that what we're going to actually see is is that I, I believe that the spirit world mirrors the physical world and vice versa. So I think that our soul, if I could say it this way, when we when we come to the time of the spirit side of things, I, it appears to me that our spiritual soul has an image that is very connected with our physical one. Now, I don't mean to alarm you, 
Because somebody said, oh, man, I got so many aches and pain. Well, don't worry, you won't then. <laughs> but it seems to me that Paul is saying, I will understand and recognize things the same way as I will be recognized. It appears that my spiritual body is going to be a visible visage, recognizable. Now, I want you to remember that well, just after Jesus died and he resurrected, they didn't recognize him at first. Even Mary mistook him, thought he was the gardener. He appeared and started walking with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Most historians believe that one of them was Luke. And because Luke was going to become a future writer of, of, of the New Testament, Jesus spent this particular time with him, and, and they traveled that day. Remember, they, they were talking, said, he showed up and said, what you guys talking about? And they started talking, said, oh, you wouldn't believe what just happened. And they started talking about it. Finally, the night comes. Kind of well, come in. Let, let's get in. And he sat dinner with them. They talked with them. And he joined them in discussing the Torah and messianic prophecies. In Luke 24, bring it up on screen, verse 30. And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. And they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while we talked by the way and while he opened us up the Scriptures? All of a sudden, when, they realized, when he opened their eyes, basically the veil was lifted. They were able to have a momentary glimpse from the physical world into the spiritual world, and they saw him for who he is. And then when that was accomplished, Jesus slept. But then they began to put it two and two together. Say, you know, we didn't see it before, but we felt something when we were around him. You know, none of us have seen Jesus face to face. But I'll tell you this, I've sure felt his presence. And I've sensed things around him. And when that day comes, all of a sudden the dots are going to connect. And I will see him for whom I have felt his presence all these years. It's interesting that while, the fle while we're in the flesh, the physical eyes are limited to what we see. But 60 years after John walked with Jesus, he had a vision on the Isle of Patmos. And when God opened up the vision to him in Revelation chapter 1, he recognized him immediately. Now, Jesus was not in the exact same form that he was while he was in flesh, but he was recognizable. Now, the question is, how did he know who it was? Because on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, John saw Jesus being transfigured before them. What happened was Jesus showed them a glimpse uh, of his glorified body. I believe he did it so he would... They would recognize him and understand what's going on. Now, John had seen him on the Mount of Transfiguration. And then when he saw him in the book of Revelation in a vision, I knew him. And he fell at his feet as dead and he began to worship. It, uh, bring up Acts chapter 7. It, it happened with Stephen when Stephen was being martyred just at the time of his death. Uh, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, Acts 7, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens uh, opened and the Son of Man standing uh, on the right hand of God. Moments before his death, as he's being stoned, the veil was rent back, and Stephen sees the heavens. And, and, and now I want to explain this just real quickly because he, he wasn't seeing a trinity. And, and because we know that because you can't take this story by itself and explain what's going on. You've got you to gotta mix it with others. So here is the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay, So there's something else going on here. What he saw was Stephen saw the heavens open, and he recognized that it was Jesus that was opening the door for him to enter in. He was standing on the right hand of God. All right, now, you have to understand, in Jewish colloquialism, the right hand of God was a Jewish expression that meant power and authority. He wasn't talking about plurality. He wasn't seeing triple. He wasn't even seeing double. Mm -hmm. What he was saying is he was seeing Jesus in a glorified, he recognized the man that he had known in the flesh. He saw him in a spiritual change. 
and recognize that on the differences now when he's seeing him, he's seeing him with all power and authority that has been given unto him by heaven. And not only what's, what's really kind of amazing about it is when Stephen had all this stuff opened up to him, re- read on it, bring up verse 57 and l- listen to how the demonic-filled people that were around him, hate-filled that were stoned him, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at, the, at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, who you and I know would become the Apostle Paul. What a dramatic death. What a dramatic chain. And Paul, still Saul, witnessed the entire thing. Now, Stephen obviously, presumably, had met Jesus in the flesh before But now he sees him in the position of high priest. But the point I want to make to you is that John recognized him in the spirit realm. Stephen recognized him. He was a recognizable character. Even though it was changed, it was recognizable. The reason that Mary didn't quite get it at first, Jesus told her, don't touch me, I have not yet ascended. But after he ascended, and took on the full change of of the glory, all of the disciples would be able to recognize. Before before that, he appeared to them. Remember the Bible says he appeared to them, the room, the door being shut. And all of a sudden, he revealed himself to them. He opened their eyes to see, and they saw him. And he, he was recognizable enough that they saw him, they knew who he was, and he offered to show them the handprints in his, or the nail prints in his hand. Came back seven days later and he, he, he showed Thomas who was with him. And Thomas became so convinced. He, he said, my Lord and my God. Talk about revelation that came. Because Jesus revealed himself. All I'm trying to say here is, is that the glorified body that Jesus took on was certainly glorified compared to what it was in flesh. But it was still recognizable enough that everyone knew who he was. So the question comes to mind, okay, if my spiritual self appears anything like my natural self, and that's scary. <laughs> so, whoa, 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 whoa. You mean I'm going to look like this for eternity? <laughs> And what do you do if you make it to old age and you're, you're 90 years old and, and your body's hurting and you're, you're, you can't hardly get around and, you, and, and, and then somebody tells you, hey, don't worry, you're going to be recognizing that I don't want to be seen like this. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Those of you that are older, how many of you have ever said something like this? I wish that I could know what I know now and just be able to go back to like 20, 25 years old again. Show of hands. How many of you have ever said, (laughs) everybody over 40? (laughs) I think, man, if I could know what I know now, if I could have the wisdom of experience and knowledge and all this stuff, if I, if I, if I could have this and, and give me back my 20-year-old body, between that and, and, and if I could get government funded, I'd be awesome. I'd be awesome. I mean, I'd have, the, I'd have, I'd have energy. I, 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 you know, I, I, I wasn't a bad-looking young man at one time. But here's the good news. We will have a spiritual image that is recognizable. And here's the, here's the thing I want to tell you. If you've ever said, I wish that I could have what I know now and just go back to it, it's going to happen. The question is, 
that spiritual vision that's going to be of us, what, what is it going to look like? Well, you know, again, the Scripture doesn't particularly tell us. I'll tell you what the Jews believe. The Jews believe that what we will see in the Spirit is, will be equivalent to roughly about what we were at age 30. They actually think it's age 30. Now, but without malady or defect. Now, again, you say, well, you know, I had this. No, no, no maladies, no defects, and you will be glorified. Listen to this. Um, at age 30, was uh, under Jewish terms, that's when it's considered to be a full-grown man. God did not even allow anybody to join the Levitical priesthood until they were age 30. That's why Jesus waited until he was 30 years old. Fully matured. It's not just being fully matured. Now, they'll have a bar mitzvah for you at 13 or 12 or whatever it is. You say, okay, physically you're grown enough. You know, that, you know you're, you're, you're kind of, you know, man. And, and surely by age 20 and 25, I mean, you're strong and strapping. You, but, yeah, you're still not, you know, all the synapses aren't firing fully yet. But by the time you get to age 30, you, you've, you've hit your, your apex. Bring up Philippians 3. For our conversation, or in other words, community, is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. The reason this is going to happen is because our spirit, our soul, I should say, does not age the same way that our flesh does. Our flesh starts as a baby and, and you know, cranks throughout life. It deals with all kinds of issues and maladies. And, and remember, when God formed Adam, he made him as a full-grown man. And when he made Eve from Adam's rib, he formed her as a full-grown adult female. But this flesh is under the curse, and we grow old and we die, and we experience death and back to the dust because, because that's what you know, came upon us. But our spiritual DNA is different. It has a different design to it. I am hesitant to even use the word molecular because I don't know that it is. It's spiritual. The spirit world does not age. So God is a spirit. He is in three times... In the Bible, his, that spirit, is, it's vintage. It's called Ancient of Days. We know angels are as well. From the time angels are created, they become eternal beings. The Bible says that creation, before humanity ever came along, the morning stars sang together. This, this, by the way, this is who I think God was talking to when he, in, in Genesis 2 or 3 when he said, let us make man... In our image and in our likeness, he wasn't. He wasn't talking. He wasn't a multiple character. He's talking about the spiritual world. Let us make man, as the morning stars are singing together. The angelic world is already here, and and he said, We're, "I'm going to make a man in my image, in the spiritual image." But he made it just a little lower than the angels because he housed it in flesh. But that flesh was given immortality. Michael, Gabriel, all the angels we're aware of, they all predated Adam. Adam was made with a soul the same as the angels, and I believe you and I are as well, but we're housed in a flesh. And angels have been on assignment throughout all of history. They fought over the body of Moses. They gave Daniel his 70-week vision and prophecy. They announced the birth of, of John the Baptist. They announced the birth of Jesus. They they showed up in Daniel's lion den and shut the lion's mouths. Excuse me. During the great tribulation, uh, much of what's being done in the earth is going to be angelic operations. Bring up one last verse for tonight: Revelation twelve and seven. For there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. John said, and the dragon fought. And his angels. 
and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Now that word heaven, in, in, the, in the Greek, it, was, it, it literally meant the firmament, or in other words, the sky. We understand that you know terra firma is here at earth, and there's a level of heaven. Three level, Paul was caught up into the third heaven. That was a spiritual dimension that's unseen unto us. But we do see the, the second heaven, which is the, the air around. We've, every time we get in an airplane, we're flying through it. This is the same level of heaven that Satan has become the god of this world. At he has, he has power in that area. But watch what happened in verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. Now, just so we're sure who we're talking about here, it's that old serpent. Same one in Genesis. He was called the devil. He's also been known as A.K.A. Satan. <laughs> Whatever you, all the A.K.A.s, everything that he, he which deceived the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now we know that before Adam was made. We understand that the Bible indicated that there was a, a, a change in heaven, a third of, of, of the angels rebelled, and Lucifer was cast into, I may should say onto, this planet. Somebody asked, why did, why, what's the point of all this? Why, why are we even here? Why did God make people? Why? They're actually, from a biblical worldview, there's actually an answer to it. I believe that the whole point and purpose of this whole experiment, if you want to call it that, of humanity, boils down to this. Lucifer was the high anointed cherub that got pride in his heart, and he led a third of the angels to fall. I believe that God is in a process of restoring the losses of heaven. Mm -hmm. He's going to restore it with the people of God. He's going to restore it with the, the church. And I believe that when it's all said and done, when you ask the question why, as a matter of fact, I'll be honest with you, when I was studying this, man, the Holy Ghost was dealing to me, and I, I, I may be brewing on a message coming up to preach even about, about this old house that we're in. The question is why... Why would all of this, this potential greatness and spirituality be housed in all this carnality? Why do we have to, what, what's the point of the friction of all the kingdoms? I believe we are earning the right to take Lucifer's place and to take the place of the fallen angel. Because everything that God does, he does, he's justified in it. And that's why, by the way, Satan hates the church. He hates the church. And he's doing everything he can to destroy the church because we are destined to take his place. We're going to talk more about that as time goes on. Amen. Stand with me together. Praise God. Would you clap your hands under the Lord and just give him praise right now? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, there is a purpose. There is a plan. Oh, let's just worship God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost. He caught on my shatana na Oh, hallelujah. Lord, would you stir in our spirits? Would you stir in our souls? Lord, would you start to open up our eyes? <laughs> more so that we can see more so that we can sense more so that we can understand what's going on around us more there is more to life than mortgage payments and car payments there's a whole lot more going on this is a busy planet we live on and if you think traffic's bad in the natural Way to God opens your eyes to the spirit world. It's wild out there. So be careful. <laughs> Let's end this night as I like to do with a shout of praise and a hand clap offering under the Lord. Praise God.
in Jesus' name.